Hi there, it's Jason Gorman here from Codemanship with a short video about refactoring to property-based tests in c -sharp. I'm going to be illustrating with a square root algorithm, which I did TDD, I test drove an implementation, let's just take a look, the, uh, the Babylonian method there. And I used a handful of tests, just six tests, which I've just run to make sure they're passing, um, to test drive my implementation there. And nine times out of ten, I'd be very happy with those six tests going forward to give me assurance that my algorithm really does work. But let's imagine that this square root algorithm is going to be used in some kind of safety critical application. I'm not really getting so much of a warm, fuzzy feeling from these six tests that I was before. So now I might want to do more tests. Now I could start copying and pasting these tests and, and changing the numbers. But there is a smarter way of doing this. And we're going to kill two birds with one stone here. What I'm actually going to do is I'm going to convert one of these tests into a parameterized test. A test method that accepts parameters. So let's put in one parameter there for... Um, there's our root. And there's our number. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to supply that data, 0 and 0 in this case, square root of 0 is 0, if you didn't know. And what we've done now is we've created what's called a property-based test using NUnit. Very simple feature. There's just an attribute that you adorn your test method with called test case, and that accepts parameters that must match the order and type of the parameters of your test method, and then it will automatically feed those pieces of data into the test when it runs. So you'll see when we run it there that it's picked up. There's a one test case there for zero, zero. Now, this test name isn't going to be misleading in a minute because I'm actually going to be adding more test cases to it. So let's just rename this to square root of Okay, square root of zero, zero, there we go, that makes sense. And now what I can do is I can start adding very easily, test case, in actual fact, no, nope, I'm going to do a little bit of housework first, a little refactoring here. I don't really want the expected value to come first there, even though that's how that works in uh, any unit. So what I'm going to do to make this make a little more sense to me is I'm going to noodle with the signature of this by moving the parameters around. So now the number comes first and the root comes second. There we go. Always run your tests after you've refactored. Okay, now, now that I've done that, we can very easily add more test cases. So one and one, for example, is that one further down. And if we scroll a little further, if we go four and two, nine and three, 16 and 4 and 0.25 and 0.5. So let's add those. So 4 and 2. And see how easy it is to, to add these test cases now. And 9, oops, 9 and 3. And 16 and 4. And finally, our decimal, 0.25, and the root of that is 0.5. Okay, so there you go. That's all six of our test examples being supplied as test cases to an individual. Nope, okay. Let's try again. There we go. Lovely which means we can remove all of this duplicate test code. So we've scored a bit of a win here in the sense that we've got a lot less test code to support now. So as a, as a sort of a general rule of thumb, not always, but, but usually when I have multiple test methods that are all examples of the same rule or behavior, I will refactor those into a single parameterized test. And that allows me to get rid of the duplication very, very easily. Now, if... I wanted to go further with this and add more test cases. It is very easy now to add new test cases. I don't have to write a whole test method. 
But what if I want to do 100 of these? What if this is safety critical and, and even seven or eight or nine or 10 tests is not giving me that warm, fuzzy feeling anymore? Um, am I going to sit here and type all of those out? No, I'm not. We're going to work a little smarter here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use a feature built into NUnit N -Unit to generate a range of input numbers and we'll test all of them. So, we, for example, all numbers from 0 to 99. But before I do that, we need to get rid of this parameter, the expected result, because otherwise I'm either going to have to sit down and calculate the expected square root of every one of these numbers and, and hard code them, or I'm going to have to write more code to calculate what the square root should be, which means creating another implementation, which I would prefer to avoid. Sometimes that's unavoidable, but I would prefer, prefer to avoid that. So what I can do instead is I can change our assertion here, which at the moment is just is just comparing two values. Um, I can change this into what's called a property-based assertion, where instead of saying the square root of 4 is 2, the square root of 9 is 3, I'm saying the square root of any positive number should have this property. It should satisfy this rule. For example... If we were to, let's um, introduce a variable here. Let's call it uh, uh, root. Now, it's not going to like that for a second, and that's fine. What I'm going to do is say, if we got take a square root and multiply it by itself, that should equal the original input. Now, let's get rid of that so that we only need to know the number that we're inputting. And then what we're saying is, whatever the square root is, if we multiply oops, by itself, it should equal the original input number. The square of any square root should equal the number. That's what we call a property-based test. It should hold for any positive input number. Now let's rerun these tests and just make sure they're passing. And now that we've done this, this is where we can really leverage the power of parameterized tests. We don't need to hard code all of these. Let's instead just have a plain vanilla test there. Oops. Wrong place. A plain vanilla test. But we can use a very neat little built-in feature of NUnit that allows me to say, for this parameter, please, I would like you to input a range from 0 to 99. So using that attribute, it will basically run 100 tests from 0 to 99 for 100 values of number. Let's run that and see what it does. Wow, interesting. About half our tests are failing. Let's take a look and see why. Um, there's, a, there's a failing test there. So 0 and 1 we'd already done. We expect that they would pass. But what about that? So close. So close. There's some floating point shenanigans going on here. We're, we do a floating point, uh, some floating point computations to calculate the square root, and then we're multiplying two floating point numbers together. We're going to get those little floating point discrepancies. So the question is, how accurate does this need to be? Now I've just conferred with my client, and my client says it needs to be within twelve decimal places. So let's specify a margin for error here, a delta of 12 decimal places, 10 to the minus 12. If we rerun our test, are all of our examples within 12 decimal places? And the answer is... Um, no, that's interesting. Because when I first did this, they were. <laughs> Let's try again, shall we? There we go. So, yes, they are all within 12 decimal places. Phew, because uh, that, that had me worried there for a second. Um, so they are accurate enough for our purposes, for our application. So that's fine. Now that we've opened this door, 
we've got 100 tests and we got that very, very quickly with very little code. How much code will we have to add to do 900 more tests, to do 1,000? Well, it's just one character. There you go. Let's run that. Take it a little while. Off it goes. There you go. So with no real extra code, we went from six or seven tests to 100 tests to 1,000 tests or 10,000 or 100,000, as many as you need. Or we can do them at smaller increments or however we want to. Once we've opened that door, the sky is basically the limit. You're only, only limited by the hardware that you've got as to how many tests you could generate and how many tests you could run. So this takes us potentially into safety critical uh, territory. We can do massive amounts of testing with very little test code. With some judicious performance engineering, for example, parallelizing our tests and that kind of thing, it becomes possible um, to do um, quite extraordinary eye-watering numbers of tests with surprisingly little extra code. Now, at the moment, it's telling me this won't compile. Yes, it will. Let's just run that and... Uh, no, okay. My ID appears to have um, balked itself. That is interesting. Oh, there we go. It was having a bit of a catch up there. Obviously, something going on in the background here. I don't know what it is. There we go, and there's our 100 tests. Um, just one final demonstration. What if we didn't want to do a range of numbers? What if we wanted to do random numbers? So, for example, we could say random numbers between 0 and 99, or 0 and 100, and we'll have 100 of those, please. Let's make those floating points so it knows that we mean floating point. Okay. There we go, 100 random tests. Let's take a look at that. Lots and lots of lovely random numbers. Again, all passing, all within our margin for error. So the sky is the limit here, but the, the thought I'm going to leave you on is that um, for that code, that part of our code that is critical, and if you think about it, there's usually a small percentage of code in any application, even an application that's not considered critical, that really, really needs to work. And for that code, that load-bearing code, you might want to go that extra mile. And in this process that I've just demonstrated here, I haven't introduced any fancy formal methods or any fancy new tools. I started with NUnit, I started with unit tests and test-driven development, and I ended with a property-based test that is still using the exact same tool. It's using some features that you might not have experimented with, but they're in there if you read the documentation and they're very easy to use, as you've seen. Um, so without any learning any new tools or any fancy methods, we've gone from your basic kind of level of assurance that you get with task-driven development, which nine times out of 10 is perfectly acceptable, perfectly good. Um, but for that 10% where, or, or however much percent of code where it really needs to be more reliable, um, we've got this kind of seamless path from the unit test we would normally write if we were doing TDD to the kind of property-based test we might use for safety critical or for critical code. So there you go. That's refactoring to property-based tests in um, C Sharp. I hope that's given you some inspiration. Take a look at your own code. See whether there are opportunities there or code that maybe needs this more exhaustive kind of testing and see if you can... Um, introduce property-based tests and get a higher level of test assurance. Okay, I hope that's been of some use.